Hello, welcome. This is Ethics, and I'm Mark Dorsby. In this video series, we're exploring ethics on the everyday. and really taking a look at how some of the classic arguments in ethics can relate to our everyday lives. Really sort of trying to center upon the question of thinking and acting. I encourage you to follow along. The book we're using is Ethics, Essential Readings, and Moral Theory, although most of the essays you should be able to find either online or at your local library. Um, so welcome back, everyone. Now, today's video, I think, is going to be a little bit shorter because really what I want to, I was, I, there's two different authors um, that I was planning on talking about today. The first is um, J.L. Mackey, and I was going to take a look at his essay, The Subject to Be Values. That's going to be the primary question we're going to be looking at today. There's another essay I, I, I also was originally planning on talking about, and that's The Objectivity of Ethics by Thomas Nagel. Um, today, I'm just going to talk about the first essay, um, Mackey's essay, and my video slides are fairly straight to the point. And so the goal today is really to provide you, um, if you will, a theoretical framework for understanding what the central tenets of Mackey's argument are. Now, why are we talking about ethical subjectivism? In our previous video, we looked at the problem of cultural relativism. In fact, we, we looked at two different essays. Uh, we looked first and foremost at Rachel's argument against the cultural differences argument. Again, the cultural differences argument basically says that there are different cultural moral values. Therefore, there is no right or wrong moral values. Um, and he argues persuasively and clearly that that's an invalid argument and that it doesn't follow. But he also suggests we need to take relativism seriously. There are potentially major issues and concerns and consequences that would follow out of relativism. Um, now, we should be clear that ethical subjectivism is not the same thing as moral relativism. So I want to distinguish the two, but I think that uh, by turning to the question of subjectivism, we'll be in a better position to understand some of the problems that relate to moral relativism. Now, Thomas Nagel, since I'm not going to be discussing him, but originally I was planning to, I will say that he's a, the, the, ultimately, Mackey is a subjectivist that thinks that our moral values ultimately are just, they're, they have no objectivity at the end of the day. Whereas Thomas Nagel wants to argue for, he provides a series of arguments um, to defend the sense that we can have objective, um, we can have objectivity in ethics, and that there are such things as objective value. Now, the other thing we did look at besides, I forgot, besides Rachel, is we also looked at the question of what does a moral observation look like? What does it mean to observe something morally? And we saw here is that, yeah, there are such, there, it, that we can have observations of moral life. We can have moral observations. But what we found is that how, whatever moral observations we have, they are unable to verify or falsify any of the moral principles that we think hold. So for instance, in physics, we can run an experiment and we can figure out that our, you know, one theory about the physical world is wrong versus another. And that's because our observations will give us input that helps us change our theories and so on and so forth. But this doesn't seem to be the case for morality because I can experience um, a moral event, um, but the moral event isn't gonna, but the fact that I experience it doesn't play the same role in terms of verifying a hypothesis, for instance. And so it doesn't look like our moral values can be confirmed through experience. And then he suggests, well, could they be confirmed through reason like in math? And his answer there is no, they can't be. Uh, so we have moral observation, and, but it doesn't seem to really amount to moral knowledge. At least that's where we left the question. Um, and so we're going to sort of turn here today to look at the subjectivity of values um, essay by J.L. Mackey. Now, to be clear, I'm not going to cover everything. I'm trying to really keep these videos a little bit more brief and manageable for you. Um, I probably won't succeed, um, as you know, but I'm going to try. Um, so we're going to take a look at the subjectivity of values. J.L. Mackey is an awesome philosopher. He's honestly one of my favorites. I'll be frank with you. I'm not fully convinced. I, I'm not a subjectivist myself, so I don't agree with Mackey. But when I, when we, whenever I read this argument, I am always um, taken back by what a great argument it is. He's a fabulous thinker. And so if you're interested in this question of particularly moral values, subjectivity, subjectivity and the objectivity of ethics, take a look at Max, 
other work. He has a lot of great books that are worth taking a look at. So, but this is a really great essay. And in many ways, this essay is classic contemporary, is a classic contemporary essay, but it also directly responds to some of the other moral theories we've looked at previously. Now, before we sort of get into Mackey, let's at least say something about ethics and the everyday. Um, right? One of the things I think that's on Mackey's side here is that we do have an everyday experience regarding the subject, regarding values and our subjective awareness of them. Um, and when we're exposed to differences and we begin to reflect upon them, it does increasingly look like that our values are seated somehow and rooted and founded on our subjectivity. So there, there is a way in which I think our everyday experience actually is, is some evidence here on Mackey's behalf. So let's sort of start off here. And I'm going to, yeah, unfortunately, I'll have to apologize. I've really got sort of a basic uh, PowerPoint sort of lecture here, but maybe compared to reading the book passages and highlights, this is a lot nicer. Um, so let's take a look at moral skepticism. Uh, or he starts off with the question of moral skepticism. And, and here, you need to think of moral skepticism both as a potential option, but also as a challenge. Um, the question here is, how can we be certain that, that the way we live is the right way to live, right? So for instance, if you decide not to lie to your boss, um, well, let's say for instance, uh, I imagine many of you are college students, let's imagine you work somewhere on a Saturday, um, and on Friday night, you go out and you drink a little too much and you don't feel well, and you feel sick the next morning, and then you call in sick, or maybe you choose not to call in sick and just be honest and tell them, and maybe you'll get fired, who knows? Right? But you can ask yourself, on that every, average everyday level where we experience problems like that, the question becomes, how can we be certain that we're doing the right thing? Um, and so on the one hand, moral skepticism is a problem because skepticism would, moral skepticism would be the position that we don't actually have moral knowledge. Um, and that's a problem because if we want an answer to the question of how we ought to act and what the right thing to do is, then it looks like we need moral knowledge. So I love Mackey, even though I, um, he, it's not my personal ethical uh, view, I love how he just gets right out and gets right in front of it, right? He says, there are no objective values. This is ultimately the, the, the claim that, that he's making here, uh, is that there are no objective moral values. That doesn't mean that there are no moral values. This is why ultimately whatever moral values are, they're ultimately subjective, or they're within the, the domain of the subjective. They're your own. They're, they occur for you. They're experiential. They're not things in the world. And he says, what are some of the possible reactions when someone hears this? Well, first off is to think that, number one, that's false. And number two, to think that's a very dangerous idea, potentially. And, and I think that there is, I think that my own, from my own view, I do agree that there may be a sort of danger associated with moral skepticism, at least prima facie. Um, that is, if there are no objective moral values, then the question becomes, well, wait a second, then by what reason can we say that something is wrong or right? And we do need to be able to do this, particularly with regard to jurisprudence. So if we're going to argue that someone's broken the law and that's wrong, then don't we need, isn't it dangerous to say that there are no objective values? Because wouldn't it mean we're left in a sort of cultural relativist willy-nilly situation? Another possible reaction is to say, well, that's quite obvious. And I imagine that's the reaction of many of you watching this, is to say, obviously, there's no objective values, because where are they? It looks like they're merely created, or they're just products of belief or something like this. Another possibility, another reaction is to say, if, when someone says there's no objective values, they it could just be a meaningless statement. That is, nothing of substance is being said. So a true moral skeptic would probably say, well, to say there are no objective moral values is really just a meaningless statement at the end of the day. So maybe I'd say a moral nihilist would hold that third position. Now, how can we respond to this? Well, Mackey makes an important distinction that we need to recognize. The, and that's the distinction he says between two types of moral views. The first is what we would call a first order, a first order moral value, a first order moral values, and second order moral values. What's the difference here? Well, on the one hand, we have moral values which are which we just live by, 
right? Um, and so we can observe these. That doesn't mean we can verify them, but we do see that people have moral values. I don't think they say they have them and they seem to act by them. Um, so in the law is a good example here. So for instance, when someone says, well, does that mean that murder is not objectively wrong? Well, you would say, well, from the first order perspective, um, moral values do exist, right? They exist because it's the law that it's illegal to murder someone. So yeah, you can say with certainty and you can know that murder is wrong, but you only know it in the sense that um, it's a moral value that it's held by the society and it's one that's enforced. But the question here when we ask whether or not there's objective moral values really seems to be a, a question about reality. And a question about the metaphysics, uh, or maybe I don't want to get into metaphysics, but it seems to be a question about, well, what makes our first order moral values wrong or right? Um, right? It's a meta question. And so you can see here that the distinction between first order and second order views is ultimately distinguished between, I think, practical ethics and meta-ethics, but not quite exactly. So I don't think Maggie quite holds the notion of practical ethics like we Singer does, for instance. But um, in a sort of conventional common sense way, yeah, we have, we have moral knowledge. So we don't have to be moral skeptics about whether or not murder is wrong. We know it's wrong. But why is murder wrong? That is the point at which it looks like the only recourse we have is to subjectivity itself. Now remember, when I talk about subjectivity, I'm talking about the experience, ultimately I'm talking about an experience between myself, a distinction between my experience of myself and the world itself. The world in itself versus my experience as my experience, right? Um, the world for me, as it were. Um, and so you can think of the subject versus object here, subjectivity versus objectivity, and, and use that as a way as what we're saying here is that our moral values, why is it that murder is wrong? It's not because of something in the world. It's not because of the world in itself. Murder isn't wrong in and of itself. Murder is wrong here because ultimately there's a subjective criteria that we hold that it's wrong. Now, where do those beliefs come from? They appear to just come from us. Um, which means that they're not objective, which means that my reason for why murder, murder is wrong may not be the same as your reason for why murder is wrong. Notice here that it does look like this would explain some of the cultural differences we do have. So for instance, I imagine that if you found, if someone from ISIS is watching this video, or if we talk, if we talk to someone who's, you know, um, slaughtering innocent people, for instance, and they believe if we talk to someone who's doing that and we ask them whether or not murder was wrong, they would probably say that murder is wrong, right? But what they would probably say is that what I'm doing is not murder, right? That's exactly what the Nazis said, right? The Nazis didn't make murder legal in order for the, the, the Holocaust of the Jews to occur. They just simply said, they redefined who counted in terms of murder. Um, and so you can see here, now I have to be careful here because I'm giving, I'm giving examples of political and historical examples, but the point here is meta-ethical, which is namely that um, we can then understand that, that why people can hold different moral values that seem to contradict. And the answer is because there's a different meta-justification, right? Because it's ultimately rooted in the subjectivity of the person who's committing them or having the moral judgment. Okay, so this raises a question about standards of evaluation. And how is it that we can actually evaluate standards? So A, statements of value are first and foremost, they're neither true or false. Um, so this, that's what this would mean. So when I say that, when I say you should value water over Coca-Cola, that statement is not something that's true or false. It's not something that you can go look in the world and see, well, is water really better or not? Right? You can't see that through an experience of the world. That's rather a value that's made on the world. Right, So value statements are not representative of the world, and they're not true or false, strictly speaking. Now, that has large consequences because that would mean that, for instance, when someone says murder is wrong, um, and they don't mean it in the legal sense, that would mean that that statement is not really true or false. Now notice, you can't say that statement's true, which is where most people get hot and bothered, but it's not false either. In other words, statements of value, 
have a meta, they're rooted in the second order of sense in a way which is, which is not even applicable as a category to things which are true or false. Which means what? It means that the person who wants moral objectivity, the person who really wants to say that no, murder really is wrong, the person who wants to argue that um, ultimately um, is looking for, they're trying to, to find the category of objectivity where none can be given, right? Now, what does this mean though? Number one, if this is not to deny that there can uh, be objective evaluations in relation to standards. So it is possible for us to make objective evaluations. So he's not denying that we can't evaluate things using standards. The notion here is that where do the standards ultimately come from? And the standards, it looks like, are what is subjective, right? The question, or that's the number point number two, right? The question is whether the standards are objective, right? Um, so for instance, imagine I can say, I can say, well, murder is when you kill someone in an unjustified sense. Right, excluding, for instance, and a justified sense, for example, would be um, self-protection or something like this. Right. So, what a policeman can do, or what a moral philosopher can do, is they can say, "Okay, well, here's the standard, and you either met or didn't meet the standard." So, whether or not you can meet the standard is objective potentially, but what the standard is is ultimately the question. Now, here, there's an interesting relationship here that. Mackey makes to Immanuel Kant. Now remember when we looked at Immanuel Kant, and if you need a refresher, take a look at the video lecture that we posted on him in this series, Kant distinguishes imperatives, right? There's such a thing as a hypothetical imperative, and there's such a thing as a categorical imperative. Now remember, a hypothetical imperative is essentially any sort of imperative. It's something you should do if you want a certain sort of thing to occur. So hypothetical imperatives are conditional upon your situation and your reasons for acting and so forth. Categorical imperatives though, those are those imperatives that apply to all possible conditions, right? And for Kant, morality rests with the categorical imperatives, not the hypothetical, right? And so for Kant, this is an operation of reason that's objective. Because it's, since it's categorical, it applies to all the entire category of human action, which means that it would be universally applicable to human action. Therefore, the categorical imperative is a moral action, something you should do regardless of, under all conditions. Right Now, what this means is that a categorical standard expresses a reason for acting which is unconditioned. Right, That's the notion, is that it's unconditioned because it applies universally to all human action. Right, Kant says... It's always wrong to lie, no matter the consequences, because lying is itself a form of practical action, which it cannot be rationalized. It's no, not rational because it ultimately, if everyone performed that reason practically, then it would become self-contradictory itself. It couldn't happen, right? If everyone lied, then people wouldn't ask questions and then people wouldn't be, it doesn't make sense anymore. So lying always has to be wrong. And that means that the categorical pair is supposed to be unconditioned. But here's the notion, is that the, what the subjectivist is denying is they're denying precisely this hypothetical categorical standard, right? Because the question is, where does this categorical standard come from, right? For Kant, he thinks that it's through a deduction regarding um, the applicability of reason under all conditions, right? That's what he thinks. I mean, he has long sophisticated argument to defend that. Um, but you can see the subjectivist doesn't think that because Kant's notion is that ultimately, and if you read really closely in, in, in his work, he ultimately says that the categorical imperative is somehow related to what he calls the fact of reason, right? Somehow reason, um, somehow the, 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 the independent force of the categorical imperative comes down to reason itself. Right, as in terms of reason's own factual objectivity. But wait a second, right? The subjectivist thinks that reason is an operation of the subject. And so it looks like this categorical standard doesn't really exist. What you have are subjectivist standards. And in the worst, I don't know, probably sort of kind of uh, loose fashion, what we would say is that it looks like the subjectivist argument is that what Kant's doing is ultimately he's just presuming that the categorical imperative works for everyone else. Maybe it doesn't, right? It looks like 
These standards are actually constituted by our choosing to think about things in a certain way, right? That, and think here about, we also looked at John Stuart Mill, right? And John Stuart Mill's notion that uh, happiness consists in the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest amount of people. We saw how Peter Singer applies that logic to animals, for instance. Um, and he applies it to, you know, the question of, you know, whether or not we should be charitable to others and how much money we should give to stop starvation and so on and so forth, right? So take a look. That's Peter Singer and John Smith. They have one framework that they've chosen to think about the problem. Um, and they've chosen to think about that problem in that way. Um, and it looks like Kant has a different framework. And he's chosen to look at the problem in a different way. And it looks like the subject chooses ultimately what framework they're using. And that means that they're ultimately choosing the, the rational means by which they can derive any of these such and such moral standards. So this is a big critique against, obviously, uh, Kant here, right? Now, here's a question, though, is what about this claim to objectivity? Mackey says the lack of objectivity in, val in values is not reason for abandoning the subjective concern, right? That means that just because moral values may be subjective, ultimately, at least second order moral values are subjective, that doesn't seem to mean that we should just give up on the notion of ethics. An example he gives here is Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell, if you're not familiar with him, is a very important uh, philosopher of logic and mathematics, British philosopher of the early 20th, well, I would say the entire 20th century. I think he died in, I want to say the 70s, but I might be wrong. Um, but he did much work between in the late 19th century and throughout the 20th century. Uh, a very, very famous philosopher. But Bertrand Russell held a view of emotivism. And emotivism is the notion that ultimately our values are really our desires. And that when we value something, it's really saying that we prefer that thing. This is a, a view that's consistent as being subjectivist, right? So the notion here is, why is murder wrong? Because I don't want murder to happen um, at its root. Um, and then, for instance, why, and this would explain a whole bunch of reasons of why people have different moral values, simply because they have different emotivist um, desires, right? And, but it does seem to be the case, though, Maggie says, that there does seem to be more. There seems to be a moral feeling that accompanies our concern regarding whether or not our values are ultimately can, are really right or true or objective, right? It looks like ordinary moral judgments include a claim to objectivity. Now, think about your ordinary moral judgment when you see someone stealing and you say, I caught you stealing, you did something wrong, right? It looks like that these ordinary moral judgments do, claim, do include a claim to moral objectivity. Namely, that what you did was both wrong for you and it was wrong for me. It's wrong for both of us, right? Mackey says that for the claim to objectivity in the concepts and language we use are not self-validating. Um, so the claim to objectivity, just because it seems that they're objective, the claim itself is not enough to say that they are objective, right? So claims to moral objectivity are not self-validating. And of course, this is only a problem for second order moral values. The first order is not a problem because you do, the claim to objectivity isn't just the claim. The claim to objectivity goes to the law. It goes to social um, existence. There's something related to the practical world that you can say it's objective on. Um, but when you ask the question, is it really wrong to steal? And I say, yes, it is objectively wrong to steal in a really real sense. By the way, whenever philosophers say things like really real, you know you're in trouble. Um, and that's sort of Mackey's point is that just because you made the claim doesn't mean it's the case. Now, what does this mean? Now, there's, and I, by the way, I'm not covering everything in his essay, but just the real key points I want you to take away um, from reading the essay. One thing he discusses is the argument from relativity. Okay, now we've talked about subjectivism. Let's talk about relativism in particular. Now, first and foremost, we have this fact of anthropology, which is namely that there are, in fact, different moral values. Different moral values do exist. It's clear because we just see them and we can observe them, right? It looks like, though, that the disagreement in itself does not deny the objectivity of the values, right? Because notice here that it, so, for instance, imagine if you're in a different country that has a different set of moral values about 
what counts regarding stealing or not. Or another example, think about, for instance, in some countries, it's common practice for people when they're pushing their baby carriages to leave their baby carriages along with their babies outside while they go into the store. This is something that's practiced in Northern Europe. And that's considered what you should do. In America, if you do that, or in the United States, I should say, if you leave your baby in a carriage outside, then you're going to be considered abandonment of a child and you're up for criminal charges, right? So there are there is an objectivity to these values in each of these cultures, but you can see that just because there's disagreement, this does not in itself deny that there's objectivity in the values. Um, disagreement, um, what disagreements seem to show is they reflect different forms of life are possible. This is a German term, Lebensform, which really comes from Ludwig Wittgenstein. And his view is ultimate, I won't go into it, but it's, it really just refers to the notion of a form of life. So you might say that people in Northern Europe who leave their baby carriages outside have a different form of life than people in New York City who don't do that. Um, and that the disagreements are really about that because what seems to be the case is that if you take a person from New York City and you put them in uh, Northern Europe where they do this, they may start doing it too, right? So it looks like different forms of life seem to come with different perceptions of the world. And that the force of the argument from relativity comes from this hierarchy. So when someone makes an argument about cultural relativism, it looks like the force of their argument comes from the hierarchy um, that's related to the variety and differences of the perceptions of our world. It looks like the differences just relate to these different perceptions and forms of life. Um, and that the argument for relativism, the force of that argument is, well, wait a second, it looks like it's not just true for them, but if you were in their place, it would be true for you too, right? But there is a counter argument here, which is these different codes may actually operate on the same principle. And the counter argument here is using, take a look if you want to do research, take a look at Henry Sigwig and his principle of universalizability, right? Um, and I don't really want to go into that. I'll leave it sort of as something for you to, to refer to in your own work. Um, but the notion here is, well, wait a second. Maybe the argument for, maybe there's a counter argument to relativism, cultural relativism, and the argument is simple, which is namely, that there's a single universal principle that somehow interacts with these cultures such that it creates diverse forms of moral output or whatnot. Um, so there may be a potential counter argument there. Now, but there's another argument. This is the argument from queerness. So if you don't want to go with the cultural relativism argument, maybe the argument from queerness will convince you that moral subjectivism is actually the, is actually the situation or the case. Now, there's two parts of this argument. There's a metaphysical part of this argument, and there's an epistemological part. Now, remember, metaphysics concerns that which must necessarily be the case, such that things are as they are. In other words, metaphysics concerns our statements regarding the substrate of reality, what exactly makes the real real. And epistemology concerns our questions of how we can know things. So there's two parts of this argument. One is the question related to the being of things, and the other is related to the question of how we know things, okay? So B, if there were objective values, then those values would be objects of a very queer sort, which would require a very queer faculty for their apprehension. Now take, go back here. If there are moral values, that is, if they actually exist, that's the metaphysical part, and if there are really are moral values, then we should be able to have knowledge of them, right? But if we're going to have knowledge of them outside of just our subjective awareness of them, then we would need some sort of faculty, some sort of capability, sensation or something that we could actually recognize that they those moral values exist and that they exist separately from our just our subjective belief system. Um, and you can see here, the argument for queerness is, okay, if you think that moral values have existence, then try to explain how it is we can experience them outside of just our own subjectivity. And whatever they are, it's going to be something really, really weird and queer. Something that doesn't ultimately probably make sense. And there's actually some examples of this. For instance, take a look at G.E. Moore's non-natural quality and his intuitionalism in, in his moral philosophy. 
Another example here that I'll jump right to is also think about Plato. Plato's theory of, or, um, no, I'm sorry here. Think about Plato's theory of the forms, right? Uh, where for Plato, there are these forms that ultimately everything has to participate in, but what are these forms exactly? And how is it that we experience them? He says we experience them through reason, but that they exist separately from the reason. Well, the question is, okay, well then, how do we experience them as being separate from reason? The answer is, you're not really able to do it. Also, Hume's criticism of solidity, cause and effect, essence, number, identity, all of these seem to be cases in which we're looking for some sort of queer apprehension of something. And this, these are the companions of guilt. He says, there seems to be no evidence for these objects, nor the requisite faculty for their apprehension. In other words, if these things are real, there should be a way to know them. But there's no way to know them, so they must not be real. That's essentially the argument he gives. And this actually will conclude our discussion on the subjectivity of values. And you can see here that, I'm sort of going out here. You can see I gave just a real short synopsis, but that may be a welcome thing for you, of his essay regarding the subjectivity of values. But what's the takeaway here? The key things for you to remember. First and foremost, the notion that when we talk about subjectivism, the notion here is that moral facts do not exist, right? There is a distinction between second order and first order moral values that we have to remain cognizant of. Subjectivism just applies to the second. Um, and then the argument here is, a, he gives an argument against um, ultimately sort of Kantian view here that we can, the, the, the objectivity of, of values rest ultimately in our, um, in reason itself, he rejects that um, because it looks like rather in a very more empirical, I think modernist perspective, modern perspective, that our values are really seated in a certain way in which we perceive the world. And that is subjective. And that concludes our discussion on ethical subjectivism. Thank you very much for watching this video. I look forward to seeing you guys online. Bye.